Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I think we'll start. And the session this afternoon, Rebuilding Trust in Finance, I think the aim of the session and the content is very clear from the title. And it's perhaps sad that this should still be an issue six years on from the heat of the crisis, but I think we have to accept that it is. Of course, there is not just a problem of trust in finance these days. The Edelman barometer prepared for this conference showed that trust in many governments has fallen recently, but banks and other financial firms, including insurers and asset managers, can't draw much consolation from that. Many of them remain on the naughty step as far as the public are concerned. More so probably in Europe and the US than in developed markets, and that's a topic that we'll want to cover this afternoon. In the UK, there's a particular problem. In 2013, there was a survey of trust in banking, a large-scale survey, which said that 73% of people agreed that the reputation of banks was bad, 82% said there was an unhealthy bonus culture, and only 4% think that banks observe high moral and ethical standards, and 13% only agree that people who work in investment banks in the City of London generally behave honestly. This is not uh, a particularly good basis. In fact, in 2013, only one British bank scored highly on the trust index, the cooperative bank. And I think we may assume uh, that that's now fallen down that table quite quickly. Uh, in terms of the response, 60% of people agreed that banks had behaved so badly that much tougher rules was needed. And the same proportion of opinion formers thought that. So in the UK, at least, the reforms since 2008 have not solved the trust problem yet. This may be better in some places, perhaps particularly in places like China, where the crisis was not so damaging to the economy. But few would argue, I think, that there wasn't a problem in terms of the relationship between customers and the public, and indeed politicians, and financial firms. But I think we need to try to parse this problem somewhat. Who has lost trust and why? What kind of regulation? would help, or are we best to focus on attitudes and behaviours? How far do we need global answers? Or, given the differences in different countries with different shapes of financial systems, should we accept that countries will go their own way? Now, to guide us through this complicated set of issues, we have a thoroughly untrustworthy, sorry, a thoroughly trustworthy <laughs> panel. Um, we have uh, Zhang Jiangqing, the chairman of ICBC, uh, one of the world's very largest banks, of course, and a co-chairman of this year's annual meeting. We have Guillermo Ortiz, the chairman of Banorte, a former governor of the Central Bank of Mexico, a job he held for so long that many thought he'd held it since the 1919 revolution. Um, Urs <laughs> Rona, the chairman of Credit Suisse, one of the survivors of the crisis, but of course affected in Switzerland uh, by public hostility to investment banks generally. Uh, David Rubenstein, not a banker, as he was hastened to tell us, uh, the co-founder and co-CEO of Carlyle Group. And uh, Lord Adair Turner, uh, who has a murky past at Merrill Lynch and Standard Chartered, uh, but then was chairman of the Financial Services Authority, the UK regulator, until it was dismembered in April of last year. And now, at George Soros' Institute of New Economic Thinking, thinking deep thoughts about economics and markets. Uh, also, I should note Archie Cox as our rapporteur, who will be reporting back to the forum on how well we behave and how close we get to answering the question. The way I propose to proceed is to give the participants a first round of fairly open questions uh, in alphabetical order. I hope that they will be brief in their response, a maximum of five minutes, and then we will open it out to comments and questions from the floor, and finally give them a chance to produce closing observations, uh, or just to say sorry. Um, we'll begin with uh, Jiang, uh, Jiang Qing, uh, and perhaps I could ask you, Chairman Jiang, do you think this problem of trust in financial firms and markets is as evident in China as it is uh, in the West, is this something that you feel is a problem uh, for your uh, institution? Bank, the banking sector has always been respected 
over several hundred years, it has been the case. I think in this century, in the first 10 years, we had a crisis impacted on politics, society, and business, as well as the banking sector. Many banks went bust. Another side of the impact is on the trust in banks. China is no exception. The world is an open one. Banks exchange information. Any scandal is quickly known. And therefore, given the crisis, trust in banks, in their compliance, and in bankers is shaken. I think in China, it's the same. It is a process of a social and democratic development. I think this will continue to be an issue. But we are a trustee in that sense. We as a bank, we have been entrusted with a heavy responsibility. Therefore, people, including those of you here, you have entrusted us with your future and lives of your families, and therefore we need a higher standards of ethics. Uh, do you, what, what changes do you think have been made in China um, since the crisis that give you a feeling that the banking system is getting better, or, or do you not see a positive trend? To be frank, the financial sector is improving itself compared with the past. There's more emphasis on risk management. This is a lesson learned. And also, there's more focus on compliance because uh, people know that uh, uh, many banks uh, have been affected because of lack of compliance. There's now more focus on rights of the consumers. So this is also uh, s an increased awareness of uh, rights and protection of rights of consumers. Uh, but also, uh, in terms of uh, uh, environmental considerations, uh, social responsibilities, these are all are more in focus now. So as a sector, we are improving. Having said that, one has to say that uh, we are still falling short of the expectations of us. Thank you. Uh, Guillermo, let me move on to, to you. I mean, how far do you think that this is a Western preoccupation um, with trust? And, and is this something from your perch in Mexico City that looks the same as it does in London or in New York? <clears throat> well, um, let me just um, mention that, um, you know, <clears throat> not just Mexico, but all emerging markets that had a financial crisis in the 90s uh, and in the first decade of uh, this century, starting with Mexico, the Asian crisis, Turkey, Brazil, you name it, None of these countries had a domestic financial dislocation as a consequence of the global crisis. This is pretty remarkable. Huh? Mm. So um, this, this whole problem of uh, you know, loss of confidence and trust in the, in the financial industry you know, is not one that is present uh, in general in the emerging markets here. Of course, <clears throat> you know, during our crisis, uh, the uh, and I'll take the Mexican crisis. You know, the Mexican crisis uh, took, I mean, destroyed the banking system. It took about ten years to rebuild, and it took more than ten years to rebuild confidence in the system. Uh, if you look at the, you, you cited some numbers, some survey numbers at the beginning of your um, your talk about perceptions in the UK. Uh, I saw uh, a survey of uh, Latin Barometer, which is a uh, Latin American, uh, you know, uh, general survey on on a number of issues, 
And the confidence on the banking sector, they have never been high. You know, it's not that bankers were ever popular. You know, in in that part of the world or in or many other parts of the world, but there has not been any uh, noticeable slip in in, in confidence uh, in the banking sector in in Latin America. What about confidence in regulators and? central banks, and sort of whether they're the same or whether they're different, um, as overseers of the financial sector. Do you think that that has been damaged by the crisis? And does that apply to Mexico and developing countries as well? Mm. Well, um, well, I think that uh, you know, the best thing that, um, that regulators and central bankers, um, and I'm here talking about the developed world, can do uh, to help restore confidence in the system is to finish uh, with the reform agenda. Uh, I think that uh, they have, I mean, we have heard uh, a number of reports of advances in the reform agenda, and I'm not going to uh, go into that, and that that is very true, but there's still a number of pending issues uh, that unfortunately, I mean, given the nature of these issues, particularly, uh, you know, the, the question of, uh, bank resolution, cross-border, too big to fail, and so on, probably take years. No? So this will drag on, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid, for, for quite some time. And um, the other aspect, that it's something that Alex Weber was mentioning this, this morning, uh, is that um, you have these legacy issues no? that keep coming up you know, every other week uh, about litigation, uh, about uh, settlements, about uh, you know, sins that were committed uh, prior to the crisis, but they seem very real today, and they seem uh, you know like every day, uh, like nothing is, is changing, and that's a perception. It's probably a wrong perception. So uh, I think that uh, some, something that can constructively be done is to uh, certainly improve the dialogue between the industry and the, um, uh, and the uh, regulators and the central bankers. Uh, I think the initial uh, sort of lobbying by the industry and pushing back on, on, the, on the reforms was, was not very successful. So maybe a change of tone and a change of attitude, and particularly a, you know, a change of communication, but, but also very importantly, a change in behavior is fundamental to help restore this confidence. Thank you. Urs, from a Credit Suisse perspective, and given the politics in, uh, and popular reaction in Switzerland to, to failures, I'm sure you wouldn't deny that there's been a, a problem of trust. But would you like to try to talk us through the different types of constituencies of trust, if you like, in the financial sector? Because I think different things apply to clients versus the population, and how you see the way in which the regulatory agenda has evolved in order to deal with these problems. Yes, um, I think that's a good, a good starting point. I think you see literally, I would say, bifurcation or almost trifurcation of issues. I mean, you talk about trust. When you talk about um, uh, trust with clients, uh, I would say that um, you probably see that on an individual basis, you see it very differently. I mean, you have had banks where that had seen a huge, huge losses of clients, clients' funds. We had, during the crisis in 2008, we had, I would say, net new asset inflows of more than 200 billion over a five-year period, which is probably the, the largest of any bank anywhere. Mm. Uh, we have seen huge inflows during the crisis, also in our wholesale uh, uh, prime brokerage uh, uh, business. So on an individual basis, I would say the trust with clients, and you know we have a lot of obviously discussions with clients, has come back. In some instances, I would say didn't probably not go away despite criticism about behavior. But that's only one element of it. And then I would say the second, the second area is, is conduct, and I'm sure we'll talk about conduct uh, a little bit uh, later anyway. So I will not not deal with that. And the third point is, is I would say the the large the issue with the public at large. And that obviously is heavily influenced by a number of things. I would say, first of all, um, the fact that probably the great moderation may have worked for a decade or so, but has not, in the end, has not worked, as we have all seen. A lot of people have uh, lost a lot of money. Um, but um, what added to that was not just the disappointment, but also the anger that you had seen banks being bailed out by 
by governments. And that obviously then triggered this, this entire discussion about um, too big to fail, the discussion about how can you make sure you have a system that is stable enough, even in a crisis, that will allow even large banks to fail and actually be taken out of the system without uh, actually blowing up the entire system. I think on th at that front, a lot has happened, and, and probably more has happened than a lot of the people are prepared to accept. I would say the, the issue of failing, while it is not on a cross-border basis, um, I would say universally adopted, I would say there are countries where you could say uh, they have now a system in place where, where basically the too big to fail issue uh, is resolved. I mean, the US would argue, and Paul Tucker is a good, a good witness for that, would say, well, basically, uh, as far as the US is concerned, I think they have a system now in place, including bailing, that would allow failing banks to take out of the system. The UK would probably argue the same way, or along the same way. Maybe in Switzerland, we have started to, to deal with the issue relatively early on, implemented it very fast, and I would also argue we have a system now in place that works. What does not work yet is that um, across, apart from the differences you would see in, in I would say, globally, um, there is not yet a, a, a totally aligned system that would allow global CIFIs to be taken out because there's no harmonization of all the rules and unilateral uh, treatment and respective uh, uh, acceptance and acknowledgement of acts taken by a home regulator versus a host regulator and the like. That's an issue that still needs to be resolved. It's high up on the agenda. Of the, G, of the FSB and uh, I would argue probably also of the G20. But that's the ultimate lit litmus test for system stability as far as I'm concerned. That is something which is a prerequisite for rebuilding trust. People have to be convinced that in the future, A, banks, there may be banks that fail, but if banks fail, they will have to be taken out of the system and bankruptcy can occur as it would occur in every other sector as well without then have, uh, governments having to come in and bail them out. I think that's an integral part, and that is not yet, uh, as I would say, fully resolved. Could I ask you to comment also on the point that Guillermo made, which I think is an important one, that there continue to be episodes. LIBOR, obviously, one. We now have the discussion of uh, foreign exchange, potential benchmark manipulation there. I mean, do, do you think we're going to continue to see these issues, some of them arguably nothing much to do with the financial crisis, yeah. actually. I mean, you could be manipulating yeah. benchmarks at, uh, yeah. in good times as well as bad. But th this nonetheless creates a continuing drip of bad news, which does affect trust in the system. Do you think we can expect to see more and more of that? I would say Guillermo, in his analysis, was actually, not surprisingly, was spot on. The trouble is, if you have an industry, and I would take it wider than just the banking system, just finance generally, if you are on the spotlight by the media, by the public at large, every little incident basically uh, kicks you back into the, into the bad spot, irrespective as to how much progress you have made in the interim. And it's clear if there is a particular focus, obviously the scrutiny uh, of which you look into, into issues um, uh, is even higher. And there's, there's no, no excuse possible for, for things that you know, have come to light, like LIBOR and, and possibly other things. And that basically before you have resolved those issues and gone through them, I think it will be very, very difficult to fully restore trust in the system. One should not forget, however, that um, this is not just something which, is, which represents this, uh, the, the banking sector as a whole, but it's something which are, are things that happened in the past that have to be worked, uh, worked up and uh, have to be resolved. And this will take time. It will be difficult to create that trust that ultimately the sector desperately needs to be fully functioning, in my opinion. Uh, and therefore, I think it's a prerequisite that you get through these issues as industry-wide issues to the extent they are, and on an in individual basis to the extent that banks are at fault, to put them behind you so that you can move on. But every additional incident that comes up, no matter how small it is, is in a way is a, is a step back towards creating that trust. So more trouble to come. Uh, David, um, you're not a banker, um, perhaps never wanted to be. Um, but from your perspective, Carlisle, obviously a huge financial institution of a different kind, do you think we're talking about a banking problem or do you feel in your business that there has also been a failure of trust in or a 
collapse of trust in the financial system more broadly? Well, generally, I, I think it's, we should make it clear that in good times and bad times, people are not marching in the streets saying, I love my bankers, I love my private equity investors, because people generally don't do that type of thing. We're never going to be uh, a situation where there's great popularity for banks, because that has never been the case. Occasionally, it gets worse than it is normally, because when you go through situations of the type we've done, you get a lot of headlines, and banks have lost money, and governments have to come in and, and provide some support, and that's not popular. But we have to remember that we're dealing with a situation where we're not going to find people saying, well, my banks are as popular to me as Apple is or Starbucks is or people who produce products that people can touch and feel. Yeah. Most people's relationships with banks are that they're probably paying more bank, more fees or money to banks than they're getting back from them because they're probably either borrowing money or paying various fees. And so probably banks are never going to be uh, universally popular. Um, I do think that the most recent situation exacerbated a bit in part because regulators were very concerned uh, that the banks could fail. And if they fail, maybe that would mean that, that customers' money would be lost. It turns out that didn't really happen through this crisis. Customers' money was more or less protected, certainly in the United States. But there was a concern that that could con conceivably happen. Uh, as to private equity, private equity does not, did not get bailout uh, money from the uh, US government. Uh, we don't really have government money that's insured the way FDIC insures uh, money for banks. So we're not quite in the uh, the situation where the public would feel that we had the same kind of um, f relationship with them that, that uh, banks might have. So I think private equity is not probably as unpopular as, um, as the banks became. I think private equity firms generally are not um, you know, beloved by some people who don't invest with them. People that invest with them tend to like them because the returns have been very good. Uh, I, I think we can do a better job throughout the financial service industry of explaining what we actually do to justify the fees or the, or the compensation or the way that business runs. But we have a hard time explaining to the average person in the public uh, what we actually do to earn these kind of uh, compensation levels. We should do a better job at it. But generally, I think the worst is probably behind us for a few years or so. I think the public is now focused on more th other things. I think in the United States, we passed the Dodd-Franks. Uh, the Volcker rule regulations are now out. And I think, by and large, they will be probably implemented. There will be some adjustments here and there. I think we're now on to other things. I think it's probably a good thing. And I think the banks now have cleaned up their balance sheets. I think the other financial service firms have done a better job of explaining what they do. And I think in the future, when there are future problems like the type we had, if there are, we've got to be, have more transparency as the problems are going through. But nobody should think that all of a sudden uh, people are going to jump up and down and say, I love my banks. I love, uh, I love bankers. Now, with one exception, I would say. Uh, it is an interesting phenomenon that uh, when you ask members of the public in the United States, do you like the Congress? Well, the Congress has a popularity rating of about 6 or 7 or 8 or 9 or 10 percent. Um, do you like your congressman? They like 99 percent like their own congressman. That's why 95 percent of them get reelected. Uh, the same is probably true with one's banks uh, and, and bankers. Probably people say, I like my bank, and probably 90 percent of the people like their own bank. But do they like bankers generally? No, probably 10 or 11 percent. So it's the same phenomenon as congressmen. They don't, they don't like the industry generally, or they don't like Congress generally, but they do like probably their own bank or their own congressman. The uh, Financial Stability Board recently um, invented an exciting new acronym, uh, the NBNI SIFI, um, which is, I believe, the non-bank, non-insurance, systemically important financial institution. Do you think we need such a category, and are you bidding to be in it? <laughs> well, it would be an honor to think that one um, is significant enough to be in that category, but everything else being equal, I would have preferred to avoid being in. Um, <laughs> there's no doubt that uh, some financial institutions have become larger. Um, than uh, they were before. Private equity firms were historically very, very modest organizations. Now, some of the largest manage 150 to $200 billion, and that's a large in, in this context. But again, the private equity firms that we're talking about are really not systemically uh, important in, in, in the overall scheme of things, in my view. Um, I don't think that if a private equity firm did poorly, all of a sudden the financial mm -hmm. system would collapse. I think the banks are in a different situation. So I think we should look very carefully at whether we're going to overly regulate some parts of the financial service system that we don't really need to regulate. Regulation is a necessary evil, but we don't need to overregulate. And historically, when we've had these crises, we have overregulated. And, and the result of that has been uh, not that we've solved the ability of 
governments to avoid future crises, but we've probably constrained business to do the kind of things they probably should be able to do. So I, I would say that generally I prefer to avoid the honor of being in one of those, uh, those institutions. <laughs> Thank you. Well, perhaps the uh, FSB will hear this. Um, well, finally, we get to a former regulator turned uh, quasi-academic. So it's very much a case of last and least. Um, the, uh, it's, is it a question of uh, behaviors in banks um, that got us into this mess? Or should we also think about the way in which we have thought about financial markets, if you like. Um, efficient markets, hypotheses, rational expectations, models, which it's argued did create a mindset in which regulators and others were inclined to say, well, look, hey, if the market says that, that this peculiar instrument is worth this price, then who are we to question? And led to a kind of reverence for the markets, if you like, which, which perhaps caused us to be too indulgent towards them in the past. Is that a, a thesis that you would share? And if so, how are we getting out of it? Or have we got the beginnings of any yep. new model which would allow us to achieve a better equilibrium, if you like, between markets and regulation? I, I think it's a very good question. And I think the, the fundamental answer is yes. I mean, I think if we go back to why has trust been lost in banking in particular, financial services more generally, it, it is partly conduct issues. And those include both the extremes of fraudulent, dishonest conduct, like the LIBOR fixing, which is a shock, and it produces lurid headlines, you know, highly paid people cheating the, uh, cheating the LIBOR system and then sending emails to each other saying, come over and we'll have a bottle of Bollinger and we'll celebrate, you know, this little trick. More generally, for retail customers, a feeling in some countries that highly commission-oriented salespeople were selling in products that they didn't really need, like in the UK payment protection insurance, and more generally, even at the wholesale level, stuff which has come out about people selling to pension funds or insurance companies uh, securities whose value they doubted to investors whose intelligence they disparaged. So all of that has had a major effect. But let's be clear, I think the biggest thing that has blown trust in the banking system is that there was a financial crisis yes. and that that financial crisis produced a huge setback to people's prosperity, people lost their jobs, they lost value in their house. And this is a problem because it came after a period of very significant and overt and public confidence that we'd solved all the problems and that the financial system was helping to make the world a more efficient and a safer place. So the fact is that if eight years ago, we probably wouldn't have had a discussion eight years ago here of whether compensation in the financial system was too high. But if such a question had been answered at that time, I think that the bankers would have been able to say, well, that's an absurd <coughs> question. We're doing some very, very complicated things. You know, this, this trading's very complicated, but it's making the world a more efficient system. Our risk management, that's really very clever. It has to be very clever because we've got a complicated system out there. That costs a lot of money. Uh, the defense would have been, yes, we're being high paid for some very sophisticated things which are making the world system both safer and more efficient. And 2008 was the crash of that proposition. And the crash of that proposition is a problem not only for the industry, but also for the official sector, for regulators, re uh, central banks, the IMF, and for academic economics. The fact is that, as Howard has suggested, officialdom largely went along with the proposition that the more innovation we had, the more structuring, the more derivatives, the more that we would distribute risk uh, into the hands of those best placed to deal with it. Uh, we put forward the idea that the more liquidity had with trading, the better price discovery, the more efficient the system uh, would be. Uh, it's quite interesting to look at the IMF's Global Financial Stability Report from April 2006. It has a wonderful quote, and it goes roughly as follows. It is increasingly recognized that the distribution of credit off bank balance sheets into the hands of those better placed to bear it has increased the resilience of the financial system. And here's the great phrase. This resilience, and remember this is April 2006, 15 months before the onset of the worst financial crisis, this resilience may be seen in a lower probability of commercial bank failure. So we got it wrong. And sitting behind the official sector getting it wrong, I think there was a set of academic theories that got it wrong. We fell over in love with the 
if the idea of uh, efficient markets, that markets were all efficient, that they priced things in a rational way. And we did that despite looking at the history of uh, crashes and panics and manias, which told us that wasn't, that wasn't true. We fell in love with the rational expectations hypothesis and uh, the mathematical way of a uh, modeling economics, which failed to realize the importance of behavioral and reflexive and self-reinforcing effects. And I have to say, central bankers, in their monetary theory, and in particular their monetary models, uh, fell in love with a bizarre proposition, which is that the financial system wasn't very important. I mean, broadly speaking, most monetary models in central banks didn't have a financial sector there. The idea was that the financial sector was like the car manufacturing sector. It might be doing useful things, but it didn't have a macroeconomic importance. It was described by a lot of theory as being a veil uh, through which uh, the uh, monetary stimulus occurred, uh, but it had no particular consequences. And I think the fundamental problem of all of this was that we developed a thesis that we could treat financial markets and services like other markets and industries. And I think the fundamental point about recovering trust, both in the area of conduct and in the area of macro stability, is to start by recognizing that financial markets and services are very, very different. They're very different in their customer relationships for the simple reason that, particularly at the retail level, the retail customer has almost no ability to test drive financial services, asset management services, etc and see whether they like them. They are not empowered. There is an asymmetry of information and capability. And that creates a duty of trust on behalf of a, a financial services industry, which doesn't apply elsewhere. But it's not also in the area of macroeconomics. We cannot treat financial services as just markets like any other. The absolute essence of what we have got to get to grips with is, in economics is why do financial systems and uh, introduce extreme instability into the market economy. And I think we are beginning to get some ideas of that, Howard, but I think this is very early days of developing some much more effective economics than that which dominated before the crisis. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to the, um, uh, the hall uh, now, but just let me ask one question. Guillermo, you were a central banker through this. Do you recognize this intellectual prisoner that you were of these theories? <laughs> Well, <clears throat> let, let, let me uh, uh, just add to uh, what Adair said. Um, uh, he was quoting this uh, passage from the uh, IMF uh, Financial Stability Report just a few months before the crisis. And um, well, I remember in our uh, discussions in, in, in Bal, I mean, and, and this was uh, a place where central bankers would gather and would speak freely, and uh, and and you know part of the reason why the, uh, the sort of financial sector was left out of these modeling uh, exercises in most central banks' um, analysis was the belief, you know, that um, <clears throat> the, uh, the financial institutions had developed uh, such sophisticated models of risk management. Uh, that um, it was almost impossible for regulators to improve on them. And uh, this you know, notion of light touch regulation and the notion that uh, you know, financial institutions would not only allocate resources you know, from savers to the most productive users, but that more importantly, they could manage risk well mm. was pretty pervasive. And uh, I, I think that that is, that is uh, absolutely true. I mean, if you look at uh, the statements of some very prominent central bankers, you know, as early uh, or as late as 97. Uh, 2007. Yeah. I'm, so, I'm, I'm sorry, 2007, uh, the, uh, the probability of a systemic problem was very much minimized. Yep. Yep. And so uh, I just, uh, I'm expanding a little bit on okay. what that is. I, I, we should point out that, yeah. that while we did have a financial crisis that was significant, more significant than we've had in quite a while, we, we are not going to repeal the business cycle. For a while, there was talk in the United States that we now had such sophisticated models at the Fed that we could, re we had effectively repealed the business cycle. We could modulate um, 
uh, our way uh, out of having recessions. That proved not to be the case. And I don't think we now really feel that we can get rid of these kind of business cycles. And so we're going to have a crisis or a recession or something of this type again in the future. And we shouldn't think that we have figured out through Dodd-Franks or anything else how we're going to eliminate this type of possibility. Yeah. Sure. But th th this was no, uh, yes. you know, ordinary business cycle. It ordinary, but, but, the, but we'll have things like this in the future. No, I, I'm sure, but I, I, I was looking uh, the other day at um, a paper published by the Dallas Fed uh, just six months ago, and they were estimating that the cost in the United States of the crisis in terms of output, output for gun is between 40 and 80 percent of 2007 GDP for the states. So I mean, this is yeah. these numbers I mean, are I, just I, massive. I, we're not going to repeal the business system, but I think cycle. we would be about business cycle. But I, I think we should be aiming to uh, make sure we don't do 2008 again. I mean, broadly yeah. speaking, there are two of these in the history of you know, advanced capitalism, and, and, and they're this one, and they're 1929 to 33. And we're not going to get rid of the normal business cycle, but I think we ought to be aiming to get rid of cycles well, we like can, this. We can do better than we did in protecting people against what happened before and maybe um, enhancing protection that some people would like. But I don't think we should feel that we are so smart that we're now going to figure out how to plug every potential problem in the yep. system, because every time in the past, um, as Ken Rogoff pointed out in his book, when people figured out that they, they've had a problem and they're going to try to plug it next time and fix it, they have missed what was the next problem. So there will be something in the cycle next time we won't Look, really anticipate. We don't know how great it will be. I would Hopefully say that part straight. of what happened this time was exactly what happened in the 1920s. It was an expansion of credit very similar to the 1920s. Yeah. I mean, well, the interesting thing is about the, 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 the banking system, it isn't that we create new mistakes. We just keep, keep repeating the same mistake. I mean, pretty much the iron law of banking is that somewhere in the world, every 15 years, we have a massive commercial yeah. real estate but boom and bust. It was, but, but they didn't have the type of mortgages in the, in the 20s that we had now. What we were doing was giving mortgages to people who really didn't deserve them, uh, probably by normal standards. And that probably wasn't the case in the 20s, I think. I think the, the, other, the other difference also was that the interconnectedness of the system the interconnectedness is such was huge. Was huge. Yes. And that was probably not, also that was not a the new case feature, in obviously. 1929. Yeah. Right? As you'll have observed, just as the regulators lost control of the financial system in 2007, I have lost control of this panel. Um, <laughs> but uh, we'll try to regain control, just as the regulators have. And let's take one or two points from the floor. Uh, down the front, if you could give your name and designation and the number of your bank account. Um, I can give the first two. Alex Edmonds from Wharton and the London Business School. So, um, so Howard mentioned at the start the public's mistrust with incentives. So what's your guys' view as to the role that incentives played in the crisis? So one view, just to caricature it, is the incentives were completely wrong. The bankers knew they were taking bad decisions to maximise risk for the short term, but they did this because they had short-term incentives. Institutional investors knew this as well because they were only caring about holding their shares for the short term. But the other view is that that actually wasn't incentives. Like Lehman Brothers had perhaps closest to the compensation model that people advocate, employees owning stock in their own firm. And it was instead, as Lord Turner was suggesting, bad models. So those were bad mistakes in the end, but these were not deliberate mistakes. So where do you stand on this spectrum? And what does this mean for your views as to how to change governance and compensation to solve um, this trust issue going forward? And in particular, if you think it's sort of bad model, nobody has the right model. Academics, practitioners, um, regulators don't have the right model. How are we going to stop a new crisis from happening, as David was intimating. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to be quite disciplined, because if we have one question and, and uh, five answers, that won't really work. I'm going to ask Urs and then Adair quickly to comment on that. OK, well, on the first one, I think to have models and to have right, uh, good risk models is something which we should not just now throw overboard and say, well, no, this hasn't worked uh, in 2008. Now we don't want to have uh, risk models anymore. I think that's it. We, we, we work, I think, the whole industry, including with regulators, we work very hard on developing, on developing and having proper risk models. I think that's a prerequisite for a functioning uh, global financial market, uh, as far as I'm concerned. But as, as, as it relates to a compensation or incentive issue, I think there's common wisdom that, that uh, you have to set the right incentives for people. Now, you can have an argument as to whether this was the case before 2008, and you would find, certainly would you find incidents where this you know, was the case that Perhaps uh, incentives were not properly structured. I think in this area, a lot has happened since the crisis. If there is one area where I think universally or globally you have seen a huge development, it's in the area of compensation and incentive steering. 
Um, we have learned a lot more, I mean, longer deferrals and so forth. But as you rightly pointed out, in Lehman, in the case of Lehman, that was not the problem. I mean, most of the, of the senior people at Lehman had their entire wealth stuck in the firm by way of, of being shareholders, huge shareholders of the firm. So there was no reason to actually assume that they would have to, to, to it was a, 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 a basically a problem of the incentive. I think incentives may have co-contributed to the whole thing in certain areas. There's no question about it in certain, in certain businesses, but I don't think it, I would single it out as, as the primary factor for the crisis as a whole. Uh, well, broadly speaking, I agree. I think, I think it played a role. It was crazy to be paying people large cash bonuses at the end of the year before you'd really worked out whether what they'd done was sensible or had left a toxic trail. And I think it's good that we put in place the many reforms that we've made, but it's less important than other things. Do I think that there were a whole load of bankers, Dick Fould, Fred Goodwin, sitting there in 2006 saying, oh, this is OK, I've got a put option onto the uh, taxpayer, so I'll just ride this thing for as long as possible. No, on the whole, what they were saying is, I'm a really, really clever person. I am involved in a, a wave of innovation which is making the world a better place. I mean, that was their thinking. They were brought, they were caught up in the same, uh, this time it's different hype. Uh, they weren't cynical, they were deluded. Um, and so to, the, the, the fixing the incentives is important, we have to do it, but it's not as important as the development of much more powerful levers to lean against the inherent uh, nature of the credit and asset price cycle. That's the crucial bit of the economic model, so I think we have to get right. Thanks. Next. Yeah, back there. Can you get a microphone? Thanks very much, sir. <clears throat> this is a very... Uh, Sorry, can we have your name and... Um, my name is uh, Rana Kapoor. I've... Uh, privileged enough to have established a bank called Yes Bank in uh, very uh, turbulent times uh, through the global crisis, through the uh, Eurozone crisis, and a very protracted Indian crisis, which is still going on. And I'm very uh, happy to report to you. I have confidence. I have conviction. And I think uh, also very effective communication, believing that the business of banking is a public trust business. My question, sir, is that uh, we discuss the vagaries of the past, we discuss the new elements of regulations in the future, but uh, the incidence of risk in banking, whichever part, at least in my assessment, is reputational risk, beyond credit risk, beyond structuring risk is uh, really reputational risk. How do you build brand equity, which creates a trust mark, which creates immense confidence of the public <coughs> to really believe in banking all over again? And it's got tainted because of past reasons, but it can be built with super confidence if the regulators start taking it a little easy. So my question is, how do you really take care of the most important risk which is reputational risk. Thank you. Um, uh, sorry to come back to you, but I guess, um, I mean, you, it's not that, as, as I said at the start, Credit Suisse was not one of the worst, but nonetheless, you were affected by the broad reputation of investment banking. How do you think about reputation risk in your bank? Well, reputation risk has always played a significant role. I mean, I start from the premise that actually trust of the clients and our society at large is the fundament of or the foundation of what banking is all about. And I think what has been lost uh, or had been lost in the past a little bit was the idea that, you know, this is truly a service industry and you have a fiduciary trust relationship with your clients and you have to do what is best for your clients. And that everything that you do that undermines that notion actually goes against your reputation. And if it goes against your reputation, it is detrimental in the end also to your economic success. So it plays a very significant role. We have high standards, we, we, we actually measure our people against it. It's a significant part of the assessment of performance of our, of our people, of our senior people as well. And uh, in my opinion, it's one of the fundamentals to actually run a bank successfully long term. Chairman okay. Jiang, you, you are <coughs> building a reputation internationally. Of course, ICBC has a big reputation in China already, but as you enter new markets, which you have been doing on uh, quite a sizable scale. How do you think about building a reputation for your bank? Uh, 
Uh, I have uh, listened very carefully uh, for the discussion, and I would like to uh, expand my answers. I think that the reason of the uh, crisis uh, caused by uh, stakeholders, uh, and I think that some uh, stakeholders uh, take uh, uh, the main responsibility, for instance, the regulators and the banking side. So in, in order to prevent the uh, risk, and we, and I think that we uh, could do four things to re-establish our reputation. Firstly, uh, we should re-establish our regulations because the creati creativity uh, on the one side and the regulation on the other, but regulation should not go ahead of the um, uh, and then so we should uh, uh, create, uh, creation. So we should, we have a saying in China that if we lost some uh, sheep, the sheep coming out of the uh, cages, and we should uh, first uh, find the hose and uh, mend the hose. And for instance, now we have uh, uh, Basel uh, th uh, 3, and uh, the uh, regulations uh, such as this, such as uh, Basel uh, 3, should be established as soon as, uh, as possible. Secondly, we should uh, re-establish uh, the target. And uh, for instance, commercial um, banks and uh, the investment uh, banks, uh, they have a problem that they set the targets too high. And uh, uh, so short term, uh, they, are, uh, they, are, they are pursuing the short term interest. So uh, well, now, uh, with the regulation, with the tighter res regulation, we should set the target a little to lower, and for in this way, we could uh, uh, have uh, obtain a sustainability in the long run. And uh, so, thirdly, we should uh, uh, reestablish the trust because uh, the uh, banks are the trustees, and from the Middle Ages, and uh, there is only one uh, bench. Uh, uh, with a bench with a, a banker sitting on it. And uh, if uh, uh, the money was not uh, paid, and the the uh, the bench will be uh, held by by the clients and uh, hit uh, hit the the bankers. So now it's actually the same thing, and uh, I think that uh, there is an invisible asset for our bankers. That's the trust, and that's very important. So the thirdly. We should uh, go back to our tradition. And now we have uh, seen the modernization of the banks, and uh, some banks are forgetting their basics and uh, their originals. And uh, so what are the basics, apart from all these uh, financial derivatives, uh, the variety of complexity, the products, and the, what the people get lost in their uh, basic uh, the services. And some banks, uh, actually, they are pulling their hair, uh, trying to uh, get out of this planet. And uh, I think that we should go back to our traditions, and uh, only by, in this way we could reestablish our trust. And uh, well, I wouldn't use the word of renaissance. Re and uh, we should uh, restart and uh, reestablish our trust. Thank you. Thank you. Well, back to the future is uh, the motto there, perhaps. Let me take, um, yes, at the front here. Um, thank you. Um, when we have. I know who you are, but not everybody <laughs> does. Katinka Barish from Allianz. When we have a crisis in politics, we might fiddle with the electoral system and increase the supervision of party finances. But most importantly, we call for more honest and better political leaders. Perhaps a question to Urs Rona and, and um, Adair Hörner. Do you see a role for the bankers themselves in overcoming that crisis of trust that we still have? Thank you. Yes, well, it's been directed at you. 
Um, would we be better if an honest man led Credit Suisse? Sorry, I, mean, I think that I'm just paraphrasing. Yeah, yeah I, I think I got I got the idea. Um, yeah, I think that's. A, I would say it's probably the, one of the or the prerequisite. I think what you have to do is basically you have to to first of all you have to define the values uh, of of what your organization stands for, and then you have to live them, and you have to lead by example. And if you don't do that, then you have to take the consequences. There's no question about that in my mind. Otherwise, you will not be able to fix it. I mean, let's not forget what ultimately banks are. Banks are an amount of capital, actually a sizable amount of capital now as a result of the changes of the, of the regulation. Um, funding, credit, and a lot, a lot of trust by everybody, every, all the market participants, clients, uh, people, uh, other banks, and so forth, that actually you will honor your commitments. And that you have to make sure, and you have to lift that, and you have to lift that by example, and you have to make sure that you do this in a credible fashion. So credibility is probably one of the, of the most important assets that you can have. Not just if you're the chairman or the CEO of a bank, but across the bench if you are a managing bank. Actually, it's probably not only true for banks, if I may say so. David, you. I'd say about 30 years ago or so, we began to um, deify business leaders and began to publicize them to a greater extent than before. I would say 30 years ago or longer ago, bankers were more or less faceless, and very few people could name the chairman or CEO of most banks. Uh, today, because of the proliferation of media, because of the crises we've had, and because of uh, all kinds of new services, internet services, blogging, and so forth, everybody seems to know the name of the CEO of every major bank. And as a result, they have a greater uh, obligation, and so do people in private equity, to um, you know, deal with their issues of reputation. They have to stand up and be the symbol of their organization because the organization itself can't move and isn't as, people can't get their minds around what an organization does as much as what the CEO or chairman are doing. So the CEO and chairman have to be much more public, much more transparent. They have to be a role model. I think some of them have done a very good job of that. Some have not done as good a job of that. I think most of them now recognize that in the future, they've got to be more public than they were, more transparent, and more understanding of the concerns of the average public. And, 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 and citizen than probably they did 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. Thank you. I'm going to take one more. We've just about got time, I think. Um, yes, here. Third row. Um, my name it's, is Mike is coming to you. My name is Jeroen Dijsblum. I'm the Dutch finance minister and presently also the president of the Eurogroup. I'd like to pick up on that last point of the role of bankers because I was struck today in a couple of sessions by the openness in which some of you are bankers and regulators now talk about the problems that we've had and how we're dealing with them. I find in my practice that I as a politician have to talk to the public and to the parliament and to the media about what we're doing regarding the banks. And um, I'm not being helped very much by bankers. I'm being quite frank. So what I'd like to ask you is to have the same frankness and openness that you have here today in this more or less private setting uh, outside and talk to the public and tell them what you're doing and also reflect on what's happened. I'm not asking you to apologize, not at all. Uh, but, but make the analysis in all openness and frankness and talk to the public about what you're doing. Um, and my second point would be, we're all trying to work out how to not have another crisis. We're probably getting things wrong and over-regulating and doing the wrong things. And this is probably all true, but it would certainly help if when we take steps forward, the financial sector would not respond so defensively or negatively, but also say, sometimes these politicians are probably doing the right things, and the regulators are probably right in imposing some more strict rules and regulations. That would also be a signal that you understand where it comes from. So thank you very much for your openness and directness today, and hope to hear much more from it. Thank you. Uh, Adair, did you feel when you were a regulator until quite recently, uh, that the financial system was still too defensive and not prepared to come out and communicate in the way the minister asked? Well, I, I certainly think that the industry, in response to the re-regulation that was required, that it still had a tendency towards a 
reflexive attitude was if we said the capital uh, ratio should really be 10%, they'd say, oh, well, how about 10% minus two? Uh, well, you know, whatever we said, it was less. And at any time that we said it, there were always arguments of why, oh, you'll, you'll get in the way of lending to the real economy, you know, you'll, uh, we won't be able to raise the capital, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There is a very strong tendency to, as it were, fall into a negotiating stance with the, uh, the regulators. And I think there was a failure on the behalf of the industry to realise that the public really didn't like that and correctly didn't like that. And in the face of this enormous crisis of 2008, uh, really wanted the industry to say, we want to you know, come over onto the same side as the regulators and the central banks and work out how radically we have to reform this uh, to be a more stable system. And I think that that tendency, which I think has diminished over time, uh, but certainly during the course of the debates about Basel III, um, I can't actually remember any of the bankers whom I was dealing with saying, Adair, you know you say it should be 10%, how about 12%? For, funnily enough, none of them went that way, <laughs> and it would probably have helped the debate if they had. Uh, so are you still part of the problem, or are you <laughs> becoming part of the solution? Well, let me maybe get some nuance to what uh, Adair said and what, what also the minister had suggested. Uh, it's still probably the initial reaction uh, when on, in the wake of the, of the crisis and when, uh, when the first, I would say, regulatory, regulatory proposals came forward was somewhat defensive. But I think that stance by the industry has changed very quickly. And I can give you an example from, from our own country. I was a member of the expert commission that designed the too-big-to-fail law. Now, that was not an easy law. And as you, as you probably know, the Swiss standards are among the highest uh, in the world. I signed off on them. Uh, it was, I can say that now, it was a, a unilateral decision in the end as to how we designed the system because I was personally convinced it was the right thing to do. And I have had many colleagues who have done that in, in similar fashion, in this, even in industry bodies and the like. But one should not just uh, misperceive the fact if the indus industry organizations or individual bankers say, well, but this one we don't like because we think it doesn't make sense. I can give you another example. There's a clear tendency now towards balkanization in the regulatory environment across the globe. I mean, every country doing its own, own scheme or its own, own laws, which we find as, a, as an industry is not what should happen because it undermines the very essence of global finance. Now, as a banker, you have to stand up and say, don't do that. Get also your act together, align the regulatory system, harmonize it, have tough and clear rules, I'd rather have tough rules that are clear for everybody and are universally applied. And I can tell you when I, when I, when I think back about Basel III, at Basel III negotiations, when you read these reports and the footnotes with all the little exceptions for every country as to by when they have to do it, those were not bankers that had introduced them. Yeah. That was part of the overall regulatory setting process by governments, yeah. sometimes because governments were responsible for certain banks that were a bit closer to the government than others, and so forth. So I could give you hundreds of examples. I think one should take it on the face of it. I think the general learning of the industry is something had to be done. What happened was good. Generally aligned regulation on a global and harmonized basis makes a lot of sense. And in the end, I mean, Industry has also helped. We have introduced bail-in as a concept that came from the industry. It didn't come from regulators, I would say. And that's something that that's the path on which we should go. But doesn't mean that bankers should then simply sit here and say, well, no matter what is being proposed, we are, we are not allowed to say something if we think it doesn't make sense. You should have the argument, you should have a discussion about it, and maybe sometimes you are, you are, you are right and sometimes you are not right. We're, we're, we're out of time, but you were quick. I was just going to say self-flagellation is not a normal human instinct, and bankers aren't going to flagellate themselves any more than regulators are. When regulators do something wrong, they don't go in and say to the legislators, you know, we did something wrong and changed things the way we did it. You know, they negotiate, and they negotiate with legislators just the way bankers are negotiating sometimes with regulators. So I don't think it's fair to say that, that the bankers are always interested only in their own interest. They're interested in the public interest as well. They may have a different perception of it. But think about the bankers. Bankers today are operating under the Volcker Rule. It took four years for the regulators in my country to figure out what that rule was. So how would you like to be a banker dealing with regulators who can't come up for four years with a rule? Now they've come up with it, and it's a little complicated, 800 pages or so, but it's not always a one-sided street where the regulators know exactly what the wisdom is and the bankers and business people don't. 
Uh, we are out of time. I'm therefore not going to have another round, um, nor am I going to do a 10-minute summary. I think that it would be hard to summarise because I think there have been differences of opinion on the panel. That's always a good idea in my view. Um, but I think we would have to say a couple of things. One is that this problem is not fully solved, partly because of the ancestry of the past and there are likely to be more issues emerging and they will require handling rather carefully. And secondly, there remains an unfinished regulatory agenda, uh, both internationally and indeed in uh, individual countries. But I would say that there was sign uh, here uh, and indeed in some of the very interesting comments from the floor um, of a debate which is a sense of people all being on the same side of attempting to rebuild trust in the financial system. But I think that that will require still further cooperation between politicians, um, regulators, uh, bankers, and indeed even NBN and ISFI. SIFIs. Um, I'm sure you're going to be one uh, in Carlisle. Thank you all for your contributions.